But thank you, it's lovely to be here. It's no hardship to come to a cornfield, as you indicated, because uh, I grew up in the country. I'm a farmer by background, and uh, when I moved to Toronto in, 19, in 2001, I was 51, and for the first time in my life, I lived on a street and had a neighbor. I never had to love my neighbor as myself before, because I'd never had one for 51 <laughs> years. So I suddenly had to mark things in my Bible I'd never had to bother to mark before. Love your neighbor, goodness me, do you know my neighbor? Actually, we have great neighbors. But it's good to be with you, and I appreciate the opportunity of uh, sharing from the Word of God with you this morning. I'm going to read from the book of Philippians, a few verses in chapter 4, uh, verses that will be familiar to those of you who are familiar with the scriptures, I'm sure. These are well-read and well-marked verses. Philippians chapter 4, I'm going to read from verse 4 to verse 7, then a couple of verses later, I'm reading from the NIV. And Paul writes there, rejoice in the Lord always, and I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then down to verse 11, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I do know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. If you were to meet somebody who said to you, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, I wonder how you would respond to them. I don't know you, so I don't know, but I imagine many of us would respond with some caution, perhaps be a little cynical. If we believe them at all, we would conclude they don't have the pressures that I have to live with. If you have learned to be content in any and every situation, you certainly don't have my disappointments. You don't face my temptations. You don't live with my illness. You're definitely not married to my wife. <laughs> and you certainly don't have my kids. And yet this is exactly what Paul wrote in these verses. Let me just give you the context for a moment. When you first read the letter to the Philippians, it's not long, four chapters long, it presents something of a paradox. On the one hand, it is one of the most positive books in the New Testament. 20 times in its four chapters, you've got words like rejoice or joy or be glad. And there's a spirit of confidence and joy that seems to permeate through this letter. And if you look at a selection of commentaries on the letter to the Philippians, in probably half of them, you'll find the word joy, the epistle of joy, uh, etc. Because this is a permeating theme. And as you read through this letter, we may be tempted to say to ourselves, Paul is in a very good mood. He's obviously having a wonderful time. Maybe he's gone on another missionary journey and he's ended up on a beautiful Mediterranean island somewhere like Mallorca and he's sitting under a palm tree with his toe in the water and he's dictating to his friend Epaphroditus who's sitting under the next palm tree and he says, hey Epaphroditus, write this one down. Rejoice 
And again I say rejoice. Go on, write that down, Epaphroditus. We're having a wonderful time, aren't we, hey? And he's probably humming his favorite tune, I've got a wonderful feeling everything's going my way. But of course, you'd be wrong. You'd be dead wrong. Because the other theme running through, alongside this theme of joy, is the theme of suffering. In the first chapter, he describes himself as being in chains four times. Why is he in chains? Because he's in prison. Plus, there are lots of references to suffering and the persecution. Now, he doesn't tell us where he actually is in the letter because he knew Bible students would need something to do later. But I think there's some pretty good clues. People speculate, but almost certainly it's in Rome because in chapter 4 and verse 23, he says, all the saints send you greetings especially those who belong to Caesar's household. That's a pretty good indication he's in Rome, wouldn't you think? If you got a letter from somebody who said, all the saints in Buckingham Palace send you greetings, would you say, oh, I think this letter must have come from Tokyo? <laughs> no, it's pretty obvious it came from London. And it's pretty obvious Paul is in Rome. And the reason why he's in Rome is because he's in prison. He was imprisoned without going into details, back in Jerusalem, arrested in Jerusalem, taken to Caesarea, kept there for two years, where the governor, Felix, was waiting for a bribe to let Paul go, and he didn't pay bribes, so he stayed there for two years. At the end of two years, Felix was recalled to Rome and replaced by a man called Festus. And Festus wanted to clear up all the outstanding cases, called Paul before him. Paul said, you have no right to hold me like this. I'm a Roman citizen. I appeal to Caesar. And they said, okay, you are a Roman citizen. You can appeal to Caesar. To Caesar, you'll go. They put him on a boat, sent him to Rome. The boat sank on the way. But Paul's boats usually sank when he was traveling on them. I would never have gone with him if I was a colleague. <laughs> I would have come on the next boat and looked out for him somewhere floating. But anyway, his boat sank. He ended up shipwrecked in Malta, spent the winter in Malta because there was no, he couldn't get out off the island. And eventually he got to Rome after about a year of traveling. And when he got to Rome, Caesar wasn't interested in Paul. And he spent two years in Rome, sometimes in prison, sometimes under house arrest. And so he's writing this after about five years, five prime years in his life, humanly speaking, when he's been incarcerated in Caesarea, he's been shipwrecked in Malta, he's been stuck in Rome. And I imagine if you and I were in Philippi and we heard, we've got a letter from the Apostle Paul, we'd probably say to ourselves, oh goodness me, this one's going to be a stinker. This man is going to be so frustrated, so upset. I mean, actually, he was arrested because of gossip in Jerusalem that began with Christians. And now he's been taken out of circulation for five years. But instead, he says, rejoice in the Lord. And I'll say it again, in case you think I wrote the wrong word down by mistake and really meant to say react. Rejoice in the Lord. I'll say it twice. Rejoice. For I have learned the secret he then says later, of being content in any and every situation, whether I'm well-fed or hungry, and I've been both, whether I'm living in plenty or in want, I've been both. I can paraphrase, whether my ship is afloat and the sun is shining or it's sinking and I'm dying, I've been in both. I've learned a secret of being content. What is the secret? Back in verse 6, he gives us this formula, if you like. He says, do not be anxious about anything. I'll come back to that in a moment. <laughs> but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. In other words, 
give it over to God, and the peace of God which transcends understanding will guard your hearts and guard your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, if we pick that statement apart, he begins, do not be anxious about anything. Have you ever read anything more unrealistic than that? Don't be anxious about anything. I, I met a, a young man last Monday night whose wife gave birth to their little son in April last year. And a week after giving birth, giving birth, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And she died in March this year when the little boy was 11 months old. And he was telling me his story. And a tear began to drip down his cheek because of the pain and the agony. Wouldn't it have been cruel if I'd said, hey, don't be anxious about anything? Is Paul being cruel here? He gone to Jessica when she got the message the other day about uh, Ryan, isn't it? Ryan, after his injury, say, hey, Jessica, just remember this. Don't be anxious, will you? Of course she's going to be anxious. Why does Paul say, do not be anxious about anything? You know, anxiety is a massive problem in our culture. The Canadian Center for Mental Health and Addictions says that anxiety disorders are the most common of all mental health problems. Now, I know mental health problems involve things much more serious than anxiety. Anxiety can be serious, of course. But it says, this Canadian Center says that one in two Canadians will experience serious anxiety by the time they are 40. And it also reports that every week, half a million Canadians do not attend their work on the grounds of anxiety. And the World Health Organization says 450 million people are struggling with mental illness, the dominant one of which has its roots in anxiety at any given time. And Paul stands up and says, do not be anxious about anything. But, that's the next word he uses. He's not being cold and callous, but is a hinge that turns everything. But in everything, in the things that make you anxious, he says, by prayer and petition, that is by presenting it to God with thanksgiving, present your request to God. In other words, he says, in your anxiety, take this situation which threatens to overwhelm you and give it to God, and here's the key I'm talking about this morning, with thanksgiving. Now, everybody's going to talk and think a lot about thanksgiving this weekend because of tomorrow. What does he mean when he speaks of it in this context here? He's not saying thank God for the situation because the situation is threatening or frightening. It's big, it's real, it's massive. Not thank him for the situation, but thanking God in the situation, in everything, he says. Uh, present it to God with thanksgiving. What is thankfulness? Saying thank you is acknowledgement of dependence on someone, isn't it? 
I mean, if uh, I open a door for you and you walk through, it's very likely you'll say to me, thank you. You've done something for me. If I'm carrying a heavy load and you say, hey, can I help you with that? I say, thank you. What am I doing? I'm saying, you're doing something for me. What Paul is saying here is in everything, the things that make you anxious, by prayer and petition, that is by your communication with God, thank him that this thing which is bigger than you is not bigger than him, that threatens you does not threaten him, that frightens you does not frighten him. And with thanksgiving, give it to God. You see, Scripture encourages this in so many, many places. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18. Give thanks in all circumstances. Why? For it is God's will for us in Christ Jesus. Again, not give thanks for all circumstances. There are circumstances that we despise, that we hate, genuinely so, because they're evil, they're wrong, they're bad. You don't thank him for those things, but you thank him in those things for what? For, as he says, Christ Jesus, for himself. Lord, thank you in this situation, I have someone in whom is my security, who's bigger than this thing which threatens me. Ephesians 5 verse 20 speaks of always giving thanks to God the Father in everything, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 3, 17, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you're doing, 24 hours of every day, Monday morning as well as Sunday morning, whatever you're doing, he says, in all circumstances, uh, Give thanks to the Father in everything. Because thanking him is acknowledging his presence in my life, in my situation. So here in Philippians 4, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything that would normally make you anxious, by prayer and petition, give it to him with thanksgiving. Transfer the responsibility over to him. And if I give the situation to him and he accepts it from me, it's no longer my problem. Problem is we pray about things and we don't give them to him. I have a friend in Austria who's written a, a great little book, but it's only available in German. It's called, What Happens After You Say Amen? It's about prayer. And his point is, you talk about something, you say amen, then you go back and live as though nothing's changed. You haven't given it to him at all. You still worry in the same way. Present it to him, and when you give it to him, he accepts it from us. And so now it's his problem. And instead of anxiety, he goes on to say, and the peace of God which transcends understanding. In other words, it doesn't make sense. You can't explain it to your neighbor. It transcends understanding. It guards your heart and it guards your mind in Christ Jesus. The rest of scripture is full of it too. In the Psalms, give thanks to the Lord for he is good in the midst of whatever situation you're in. There are many other verses. We won't quote them. Romans 1.21 talks about people who have stopped experiencing God. People who knew God but stopped experiencing him. In other words, their, their spiritual lives have dried up. And this is what he says happens. Although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. So their thinking became futile and their hearts became foolish. What was the problem? They knew God, but they stopped giving thanks to him. They stopped living in every situation saying, God, thank you, I can trust you, I can trust you in this. They started to take the burden on their own shoulders. And eventually, they became foolish and their hearts became darkened. 
That's why the key here is giving thanks. You ever noticed the place of giving thanks in Jesus' own life? <coughs> Excuse me. For example, remember the feeding of the 5,000? All crowd had followed Jesus up onto the hillside and they stayed there all day and they hadn't brought any food. And uh, there were several suggestions made. The disciples came and said, send them away. Go and get their own food. Jesus said, you feed them. And they said, we, we can't. And he called Philip over and said to Philip, uh, how are we going to feed these people? And Philip said, 200 denarii. Wouldn't be enough to buy each one a piece. And then Andrew and the disciples came up rather apologetically with the boy who had a little packed lunch of five loaves and two fishes. And he said to Jesus, <clears throat> here's a boy with five loaves and two fishes, but what are they among so many? <laughs> Excuse me. I'm a bit embarrassed about this, but this boy has insisted. But, you know, they're no use, I know. But here they are. And so Jesus took the five loaves, the two fishes, and have you ever noticed how he performed the miracle? Let me read you what it says in John 6 and verse 10. Jesus said, have the people sit down. And there was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. And Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. And by the next verse, it's all over, because it says, when they had all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, gather the pieces that are left, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five body loaves left over by those who had eaten. So they didn't just get a taste or a snack, they got a full meal with lots of leftovers at the end of it. But what actually happened? Now, I just read what happened, and we can read it, and kind of our minds glaze over because... The hand is quicker than the eye in this. <laughs> Let me read you again. Very simple. It says, Jesus took the loaves and gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated. What did he do? He gave thanks. That doesn't mean he said, for what we're about to receive, my Lord, make us truly thankful. He was thanking his father. And this is profoundly important. Faced with a dilemma, disciples couldn't solve, send the people home. Philip said, we haven't got enough money. Andrew apologetically brings this little boy. And Jesus, with the five loaves, says to his father, thank you. Thank you. In other words, you're sufficient in this situation. None of us are physically, humanly, but thank you, I can trust you. Now, how do I know that's the key? How do, I, how, how do you know I'm not exaggerating this when I say that? Because Jesus then crossed over the Lake of Galilee. His disciples went first. They got into a storm. He came walking on the water. You remember that story? And then they came back. And it says in verse 23 of John 6, Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place, where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. If I was writing this, I probably would have written, they landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had fed the 5,000, because that's what would have impressed me. Or I would have said, um, you know, they landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had performed a miracle. That's what would have impressed me. I would have gone home and said, hey, Jesus did a miracle today. Jesus fed 5,000 people today. I would have said that. But what John says, no, they landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. That was the key, you see. He passed the responsibility to his father. As you know, Jesus said three times in John's gospel, I myself can do nothing. John 14, he said, the words I speak to you and the works are not mine. My father living in me does his work. 
So Jesus didn't perform miracles. He allowed the Father in him to do that work. So he related to the Father. Thank you. In all four Gospels, we have him feeding the 5,000. Same thing in each Gospel record. He fed uh, 4,000, you may remember, in Matthew 15. It says he took, there were seven loaves and a few fish. It says he took the seven loaves and the few fish, and when he had given thanks, he gave them to his disciples, and they gave them to the people. Same thing, gave thanks. When he was faced with Lazarus laying in the tomb for four days, his sisters going crazy because he hadn't come in time. And Jesus stood in front of the tomb and said, Father, I thank you that you hear me. Father, this is your business. Lazarus, come out. Father, thank you. You'll do this. And uh, Andreas all reminded us at the Last Supper, when the Lord Jesus introduced the Lord's Supper, he broke the bread, said, this is my body given for you. And he gave thanks. And likewise with the wine. This is the blood of the new covenant. And he gave thanks. As Andreas said, in a moment of crisis, when one disciple would betray him, another would deny him, the rest would run away. Within a few hours, his human body would be dead. Moment of crisis. He said, Father, thank you. I don't thank you for the cross. He didn't go waltzing to the cross. He went willingly but in anguish. Thank you, Father, for your sufficiency in this. When he cried from the cross, it is finished. He wasn't saying goodbye. He entrusted the whole thing to the Father. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And you see, this spirit of thankfulness is acknowledging we can trust him. Do not be anxious about anything, says Paul, but in everything that makes you anxious, by prayer, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and you know that you have, when the next bit follows, and the peace of God, which transcends understanding, will guard your heart and guard your mind. That's what you know. You've really said thank you. Left it with him. You see, security in the Christian life is not found in where we are. It's not found in what's happening to us. It's not found in everything going well, because many things go bad as well. Security in the Christian life is found not in where we are, but who we are with in the situation. That's our security, who we're with. Let me give you a simple illustration. I have three kids. They're all grown up now. And uh, when they were young, I remember one evening, I was at home. My wife was out somewhere. The three children in bed. We have two daughters and a son. And my middle daughter, her name is Laura, was about four, maybe five at the time. And I was sitting in our lounge when suddenly from Laura's bedroom, I heard a scream. It wasn't a cry, it was a scream, fear. I got up, I ran to her bedroom, opened the door, switched on the light, walked in, and Laura was half sitting up in bed, clearly terrified. I went over, I sat on the side of the bed, I put my arm around her, I said, Laura, Laura, what's the matter? And she said to me, there's somebody in the closet. I said, no, no, Laura, there's nobody. Yes, there is, there is somebody in the closet. I said, Laura, Laura, you've had a nasty dream. Calm down. There's nobody in the closet. There is, there is, there's somebody in the closet, Laura, Laura. They wouldn't fit. Relax. So, as I held her, she calmed down in my arm. And as she calmed down, suddenly, there was a noise in the closet. (laughs) And I thought to myself, there's somebody in the closet. (laughs) 
So I looked down at Laura, her eyes were the size of saucers, looking up at me. I said, Laura, stay there. I went over to the closet, the wardrobe, put one hand on each handle. I looked back at Laura, who was staring at me. And I opened the doors, and there was the cat. Locked in the closet. So I picked up the cat and I put it out to the window. <laughs> and when I went and sat down and said, Laura, that was a nasty fright, wasn't it, naughty cat? Who put the cat in the closet? Now you settle down and go back to sleep. She said, but I'm afraid. I said, but it was only the cat, wasn't it? And the cat's gone. You saw it go. It should be landing shortly. <laughs> she said, but I want you to stay. I said, why do you want me to stay? She said, because if you're here, I won't be afraid. And I knew what she meant. She meant if there is anything prowling around, <laughs> If you're here, they've got to get you before they get me. And a little girl says, nobody ever gets my daddy. <laughs> so I understood that. And I said, that's good. Laura, I'll stay. I tucked her in. There was a seat in her room. And I sat down. And she went to sleep fairly quickly. But what she was saying was this. It's something which frightens me. Please don't leave me because... I'm afraid, but if you're here, I'll be okay. If you're here, I can relax. And Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, give it to God and say thank you in anticipation. With thanksgiving, thank you. And instead of anxiety, he says, there is this peace which passes understanding will guard your hearts and your minds. And peace in this is not an absence of trouble or conflict. It's peace in the midst of the conflict. Some years ago in Britain, there was an art competition where the subject to be painted was peace. And there were two prize winners. One of the prize winners went to the northwest of the country, to the Lake District, a very beautiful part of England where I lived for many years, and painted a picture of a lake in the foreground and the mountains in the background. The sky was blue. He took a liberty with that in England. Just a couple of puffs of white cloud to break it up. Family of ducks floating by in the foreground. You looked at that picture, you thought, my, what a beautiful place. I'd love to go there. It made you feel warm. And he submitted his picture. He called it peace. And he won second prize. The other artist went down to the southwest peninsula of England we call Cornwall. And he painted a picture in a storm where an almighty storm was rolling in from the Atlantic. And it was lashing against the base of a cliff and throwing up its surf. The sky was black with cloud. The rain was beating down. There was a tree on the top of the cliff at a 45 degree angle as the, way, as the winds came in off the ocean. You looked at the picture, you felt cold. You thought to yourself, I'm glad I'm not there. What a miserable place to be. But two thirds of the way up the cliff, there was a cleft in the rock. And in the cleft of the rock, there was a, a nest. And on the nest, there was a gull with its eyes closed. And he called his picture peace. And he won first prize. The peace of God that passes all understanding is not the tranquil Lake District scene. That doesn't pass understanding. Travel agents put that in their window to get people to go there. Because it looks so good. The peace that passes understanding is in the midst of the storm. And Paul is in his own storm in prison. Sometimes I've got plenty, sometimes I have nothing. Sometimes I'm well-fed, sometimes I'm hungry, he says. But it's not my circumstances 
that creates my inner world, that protects my heart and protects my mind. It's giving it to God and saying, thank you. I can trust you. And instead of anxiety, there's peace. And so he says, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. And the middle of verse 12, he says, I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry or living in plenty or in want. When he says, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, what is the secret? The secret is not to get God to take him out of his circumstances. The secret is to bring God into his circumstances. That's a massive difference. A lot of our praying is God change this, change that, fix that, swap that, turn this around, get me out, get me out. Paul says, I've learned a secret, it's not that. My secret is to say, God, I want to get you in. Whether I'm well fed or hungry, living in plenty or want, having a good day or a bad day, it doesn't matter. Because it's into my heart, into my mind. That's what he says is being protective. And let me finish with a, 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 a simple thing. I knew an old man who's in heaven now. And uh, he had a little phrase that he, he, he used to say. And it was, for this I have Jesus. That was his phrase. So we'd say of every situation, well, for this I have Jesus. For that I have Jesus. He printed a little yellow bookmark that he distributed to people who were interested. It just said on it, for this I have Jesus. To remind people, for this I have Jesus. One day he had a stroke. He had two strokes in quick succession. I used to call his wife to see how he was doing. And, and one day I called his wife and I, I asked how he was doing. She said, well, he's just come home today from the hospital, so you're in luck. She said, uh, he's sitting here in the lounge. So I'm going to pass the telephone to him, but you won't understand anything he says. His speech is slurred. You won't understand anything, but he'd like to hear your voice. So she passed him the phone. I said, I'm so sorry you're having to go through this difficult time. And he began to speak. It was very slow and it was very slurred, but I understood what he said. He said, for this, I have Jesus. A week or two after that, I was speaking at an event in England called Spring Harvest. It's an event that takes place every Easter. It brings several, in fact, up to about 60,000 people attended from all over Britain. And uh, I was speaking at one of the evening celebrations, and I, I, I told that little story. A couple of weeks later, I got a letter in the mail. The lady who said, uh, I was at spring harvest the night you mentioned, for this I have Jesus. I tried to come and find you afterwards, but too many people, and I couldn't find you, and Spring Harvest were reluctant to give me your contact details, but I eventually got your address, she said. I wanted to write to you. She said, two years ago, my husband was killed in a road accident on his way to work. We have two young children. It was the worst day of our lives. She said, the day before that happened, a friend of mine wrote to me, I opened her letter, and out fell a little yellow bookmark that said, for this I have Jesus. And I thought, that's sweet. That's cute. And I put it down. Next morning, she said, a policeman came to my door, asked me to accompany him to the hospital. My husband had been in an accident, so I went to the hospital. When we got there, he had died, and I had to identify his body. We then went to the school and picked up my two children and we drove home. She said, we, it, we felt we were coming into the coldest house on the planet. It was so painful to come back to our house. So I went into the kitchen and there on the table, left from the previous day, 
was this yellow bookmark, for this I have Jesus. She said to me in this letter, I cannot tell you what that has meant to me and to my family. So much so, she said, we've put on my husband's tombstone, for this we have Jesus. And I ask you as I close, is this your Jesus? Is this the Jesus in every situation, every threat, every fear, every anxiety, every uncertainty? You can look up to him and say, Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you, I can trust you. Thank you. You're bigger than this situation. You're bigger than this crisis. And I present it to you with thanksgiving. And you know when you do, because your heart and your mind is going to be protected, is what the next verse says. And the peace of God, which passes understanding. Don't try to rationalize it. Don't try to explain it. Don't start to think, I shouldn't feel this way. And don't, don't try to explain it to people who don't understand how this can possibly be. Just know deep in your heart, in the midst of the crisis, there is a peace that will guard your heart. It'll protect your heart. It'll guard your mind. It'll protect your mind. Because I've learned to be content in whatever situation. Why? By bringing the Lord Jesus into it. And the key, the key to bringing him in is thanksgiving. Thank you. I can trust you. That's why I called this message this morning, Thanksgiving is the antidote to anxiety. Not because it's a bit of pop psychology. No, this is a real, if Jesus Christ is not alive, this doesn't work. But if he's alive, and he's alive in you, we still shed our tears. We still have our uncertainties. But we're grounded in a security and a peace that he says will occupy our hearts. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for every person in this room this morning. And I know personally little about anybody. But I thank you, you know everything about everybody. And you know there are those here this morning who are dealing with very difficult situations in their personal lives, in their marriages perhaps, in their families perhaps, in their work life. And we don't want to be in any way at all superficial or simplistic, but we do want to thank you for the deep, deep truth that you invite us to pass the burden to you to prayer, pray, and to petition you with thanksgiving, thanking you that you are sufficient. However long the tunnel may be, however dark it may be, however long we continue with this issue, thank you, we can rest in your sufficiency and rest in your presence and know that nothing frightens you. And we can share your peace, the peace of God, which passes understanding, but which guards our hearts and guards our minds. Make this real, especially for some who may be facing difficult times. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I sit down, Andreas mentioned there were some books at the back and uh, talking about aspects of living in relationship with Christ. That's the heart of the Christian life. He lives in us and we live in him. These two in particular, Christ real, alive in Christ. Talk about that. There's one on Paul, whose main theme was union with Christ, what that means. There's a commentary on Matthew's gospel, one on Joshua. There's something else on Hebrews. So they're all there. They're all one round figure of $10 each. There's also some little brochures, which... Um, give access to a, a website and an app uh, which has uh, been put together by some guys in Australia based on my ministry over the years. It's got videos, audios, transcripts, 
daily devotionals that come in on an app and that kind of thing. So there's that information there if you're interested in that. And uh, that's at the back there somewhere on a table. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles, for those words of encouragement. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you to the music team um, for helping us out at short notice. Uh, let's go into this weekend, into this week with Thanksgiving, um, so that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, can guard our hearts and our minds. Let's pray. Father, thank you once again for this morning. Thank you for the time we could spend here together in your presence. Thank you that you were here with us this morning. And thank you for the reminder that you are there with us and you want to be in every situation with us, no matter what comes our way. Father, would you uh, help us? Would you remind us as we go into our day, into our week, that no matter what comes our way, uh, you are there and we can cast our burdens on you. We can present them to you with thanksgiving because you care for us. We thank you for that. We give you glory for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us. Have a great Thanksgiving weekend. See you next week.